This winter, tens of millions of British citizens, including children, will be tipped or dumped into energy poverty severe enough to risk permanent damage to their health. Cold, damp houses provide the perfect breeding ground for mold that not only causes respiratory distress, but renders houses essentially unlivable once established. One left-leaning newspaper ran the story outlining the danger, but without a word about why this crisis has emerged. Because the woke moralizers of the environmental movement helped to create it. The narcissists of compassion, callow, self-aggrandizing, incompetent politicians, their celebrity lackeys, Machiavellian journalists, have insisted ever more loudly over the last five decades that no cost was and is too great for others to bear in the pursuit of blind service to the planet. It is irresistibly tempting at the moment for those on that bandwagon to single out and demonize Vladimir Putin for Europe's energy woes, but his current machinations were utterly enabled by the green ideologues. Anyone with eyes could see a decade ago that the idiot insistence that Europe make itself reliant on Russia for its energy security made the current situation. I've often thought about the reaction in North America to the hurricane in, in uh, New Orleans. Because there's two ways of reading that, right? One is Mother Nature has a little fit and sends a hurricane into New Orleans and wipes everyone out. And isn't that a catastrophe? And isn't that an example of, isn't that example of our fragility in the force, in the face of, of natural power? But there's another way of reading it. Maybe this is unfair, but it'll do for the purposes of illustration. It's like, you know, the Dutch build dikes, right, to keep the ocean back. And they're actually pretty effective at that because their country is mostly underwater. And it turns out that if you go to Holland, it's actually not underwater. And so their dikes are working. And so the, the Dutch were very organized people. And they better be because their country is supposed to be underwater, right? So you better be organized if your country is supposed to be underwater. And so they are very organized, and they have a rule for their dikes, which is they try to estimate the worst possible oceanic storm that will come in 10,000 years and make sure that the dikes will withstand that. Well, from my reading, the Army Corps of Engineers in New Orleans built the dikes for a storm every 100 years. And that's not so good because we live about 80 years, let's say, so that means the probability that one of those storms is going to come whipping by in a lifespan is pretty damn high, and then, so that perhaps wasn't the wisest of planning, especially because some of New Orleans is actually supposed to be underwater. And then worse, you know, Mississippi is a state that's quite well known for its corruption. And so you might also say that a tremendous amount of the money and time and resources that could have and should have and was planned to go towards fixing the problem didn't. And so the hurricane came along and, oh my God, wasn't it a natural disaster? And the question is, what bloody well makes you so sure that it was a natural disaster, right? Because if the infrastructure would have been maintained and built to the specifications that were certainly technically possible and would have actually been less expensive in the long run to build and everyone knew it, and the hurricane came along and wiped out the city, why do you think that's a natural disaster? To me, that's a, that's a natural example, if you think about it from a metaphorical perspective, of a judgmental God deciding to use a flood to teach a moral lesson. And you might say, well, that's pretty harsh. What about all those flood survivors? It's like, yeah, well, the whole flood thing was kind of harsh. And so pointing out that there were steps that could have been taken and, and also that I doubt in the aftermath have been taken, even though everyone knows now exactly what had happened, is you might consider it a diagnosis, but it's irrelevant because what I'm, what I'm really trying to tell you is how the mythological stories would line up on this because you can tell a story about Mother Nature manifesting her catastrophe and potential for tragedy, 
Or you could tell another story of an absolute failure of the human social structure and the human individual level because of the corruption to address a problem that everyone knew was there. And so that's a good example of how things, how the flood comes when you're not behaving properly. You know, and one of the things that's quite interesting about the Old Testament and the people who wrote it is that they always assume that if the flood comes, that meant you weren't prepared. If that's the rule, right? That, that's, it's like the a priori axiom. You think, you got flooded out? Hey, you weren't prepared enough. Well, how can you tell? Well, you got flooded out, right? That's the evidence. And you might say, well, that's not very fair. It's like, fair isn't the point. The point is, do you want to get flooded out again or not? Because fair would be, well, you better figure out why you got flooded out and fix it so it doesn't happen again. And that's the moral thing to do when, when you're thinking about morality as walking the path that's most appropriate to get to the de destination that you think would be the best possible destination. By the mere fact that it exists, that is, it lives and produces, the cosmos gradually deteriorates and ends by falling into decay. That is the reason why it has to be recreated. In other words, the flood realizes on the macrocosmic scale what is symbolically affected during the New Year festival, the end of the world and the end of a sinful humanity in order to make a new creation possible. Well, that's an interesting, there's a lot of information packed into those few lines that Iliad wrote because he also, at the, at, at, in, the, in the Mesopotamian rituals, the Mesopotamians would act out the, the collapse of the kingdom into chaos, essentially, at the New Year's festival. It's kind of what you do when you make resolutions, because, like, it's a degenerate, what you'd say is our proclivity to make New Year's resolutions, sort of a degenerate ritual. And I don't mean that it's bad, I mean that it, 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 it's the remnants of something much grander. So the idea was, well, the Mesopotamians would take their emperor outside the city, the walled city, and once a year, and they would make him kneel, and they'd take off all his king clothes, and then they'd whack him with a glove, if I remember correctly, the priest would do that, and then they'd make him recount all the ways that he wasn't being a good emperor that year. He wasn't being a good Marduk, because that was who he was supposed to be on earth, and that's the guy with eyes all the way around his head, he speaks magic words and transforms chaos into order. That's what the emperor is supposed to do. And so the question would be, okay, you're emperor, it's like, have a little humility here because you're not God incarnate. You probably made some mistakes. Can you think of any ways in the last year that you didn't take every advantage of every opportunity you possibly could have to take some spare chaos and transform it into habit habitable order? That's a good thing to think about. Well, that's what you're thinking about when you make a New Year's resolution, even though you don't know it. It's like, well, could you be a better person in the upcoming year? Well. You can imagine the flood and then you can set yourself straight and then you can prepare for it. And that means maybe you can stave it off, but it also means that maybe even if you don't stave it off, you could ride it out. And that's actually the story of Noah. Because what happens with Noah is that he can see that things are not good and that there's a flood coming. And God is maybe letting him know and it says in the story that Noah walked with God. Remember, and that's what Adam did before he got all self-conscious about the whole thing. He walked with God. Because Noah was straight. And he put himself together. And his familial relationships were good because it also says that, that his antenna were working. And he could see a little farther into the future than someone whose vision was completely obscured by, by fog and chaos. And he could tell that things were not going to go well. And so he prepared for it. And because he prepared for it, well, then things actually went pretty well for Noah, even though the flood came. 